Welcome to the Nokia Optical Networking Learning Essentials video series from the Nokia Optical Network Certification Program, an end-to-end -end learning program supporting Nokia 1830 PSS, VWM, NFMT, and WaveSuite-based networks. In this video, we'll help you understand the optical signal flow within an 1830 PSS node. This video has been created based on the Nokia Optical Diagnostics and Troubleshooting course. Today, we'll provide an overview of how the optical signal flows within an 1830 PSS network element, showing where the signal starts, how it's processed, and how it can be routed towards the remote nodes. We'll see the optical signal flow in three different node architectures, all based on the reconfigurable OADM or Rotom. A complete understanding of the optical signal flow is very important to start any troubleshooting process. A high-level representation of the optical signal flow is depicted in this figure. An optical signal, or wavelength, coming from a client device is converted by an optical transponder into a predefined ITU-compliant wavelength. All the wavelengths originated from several transponders are then combined by a WDM filter into a multi-wavelength optical signal to be transmitted over a single fiber. Depending on the signal direction considered, the Wavelength Selective Switch, or WSS block, takes care of adding or dropping those wavelengths to be injected or terminated in the local node. Moreover, the WSS can forward specific wavelengths over specific directions, known also as degrees, to reach different remote nodes. Finally, the multi-wavelength aggregated signal typically goes through an amplification stage before being transmitted over the fiber span. The reverse direction is similar and typically follows the same path. In this diagram of a classical Rotom node, both the upstream and the downstream flows are represented. That is, we can see both the direction of the signal originated by the transponder towards the line span, upstream, and the opposite, where the signal enters into the local node from the remote node and terminates over the local transponder, downstream. In the upstream direction, the green arrows, one or more black and white client signals are multiplexed into one single colored wavelength. Then, this colored signal enters the filter. Here, all wavelengths originated by several transponders located within the same node can be combined into a single aggregated WDM signal, made of multiple wavelengths, and it's sent to the WSS. Here, the signal can be diverted to the available directions depending on the software configuration. Before leaving the node, the signal is typically amplified. In the opposite, downstream direction, the blue arrows, the reverse sequence applies. The WSS section receives a signal which is typically amplified by an ingress amplifier. In this example, a ramen pump has also been equipped to the node. Once the aggregated signal reaches the filter, it is demuxed and all the signal wavelengths are forwarded toward the related transponders where the signal can be converted back to black and white and returned to the external equipment out of the PSS domain. What we just explained for the classical Rotom configuration is also applicable to a network element based on the colorless, directionless, contentionless flexible grid, or CDCF version 1 Rotom architecture. Compared to classical Rotom architectures, CDCF configurations provide the highest degree of agility and flexibility, as additional features are supported to enable further levels of freedom. They also provide operators the possibility to remotely reconfigure and route wavelengths without the need to visit sites to physically rewire transponder connections. Finally, this diagram describes a newer version of the CDCF Rotom architecture. A few differences can be highlighted. The most important is related to the integrated Rotom, or iRotom card, which replaces both the WSS and the line amplification stages so that everything can be done within one single device. Note that the Raman amplification cannot be integrated within the iRotom card. One final note about the amplification stage. Most metro and long-haul network architectures require an appropriate amplification stage design. That is, the multi-wavelength signal generated by the combination of components earlier discussed needs to be amplified at some point. The 1830 PSS platform supports multiple amplification configurations where ingress, egress, and Raman amplifiers can be combined. Normally, this combination is decided during the design phase with the aid of the Nokia Engineering Planning Tool, EPT. The illustration shows the way EPT represents the basic amplification components. Let us now connect to this three-node network to show where the signal starts, where it goes within the node, and how it is then sent to the remote node. Here, we have the three nodes' web user interfaces. Let's take the first one to see which cross-connections have been created. 
Although we have picked the first node, any of them could be used for this purpose. We can see that this wavelength corresponds to channel 9345, and it's originated in the transponder located in slot 110. If we check the sequence of cards traversed by this signal, we see the transponder in slot 110, then the filter in slot 14, then the internal amplifier to cope with the internal attenuation equipped in slot 15, and finally, the iRotom card in slot 17. Let's start with the first card, the transponder. The black and white signal enters the WDM domain through the client ports. It is colored, and then it leaves the transponder via this line interface. Here, you can see the optical power transmitted towards the next card, the filter, and the optical power received from the filter as well. The filter, slot 14, gets this signal from its port AD4. Let's locate it. If we check the port details, we can see that the signal is then sent out towards its SIG2 port. Here, we can see our channel 9345. Next, this port is connected to the internal amplifier in slot 15, specifically with port AMP IN7A. Its details show a total input aggregated power of negative 12.71 dBm. This optical power, after the 15 dB amplification of this card, will translate to plus 2.28 dBm. Finally, the signal is sent to the iRotom located in slot 17, specifically to port ADT17. Here, we can see our channel 9345 with a measured power of negative 2.43 dBm aligned with our expectations. The signal is then amplified and sent to the line toward the remote node. In the reverse direction, everything is pretty much the same, except for the ramen pump, which is always located in the incoming direction, downstream. As you can see, the Z to A sequence is the same, but here we also have slot 1-6, which was not present in the A to Z direction. Let's locate it. We can see a total input power of negative 8.09 dBm and a configured gain of 8.52 dB. The output power is negative 9.09 dBm, and this makes sense. In a Raman amplifier, the amplification takes place in the fiber connecting two adjacent nodes, not directly into the card itself, as it happens for instance with EDFA amplifiers. That's why we don't observe any power increase between Raman port in and port out. In fact, there is even a little decrease due to the little optical insertion losses of the fiber connectors. Let's now summarize what we have seen in this video. 1. The black and white signal enters the 1830 PSS optical domain via the transponder through one or more client interfaces. 2. The client signal is then processed and colored, and it leaves the transponder via its line interface. Three. The signal passes through the MUX stage, where it's coupled with other transponders' line signals with different wavelengths, and then through the WSS stage to be routed over a specific degree depending on the software configuration. And 4. The aggregated signal is amplified and sent to the optical span toward the remote node. Thanks for watching, and look for more videos in our Optical Networking Learning Essential series. Whether your goal is to enhance your optical networking skills or demonstrate your expertise through one of four industry-recognized certifications, the Optical Network Certification Program is here to get you, your career, and your organization on the right path. Our program features 10 instructor-led courses developed by our team of subject matter experts using industry best practices, use case-driven examples, and hands-on labs. Learn more and get started today by visiting our website. Thank you.